Calvin Calvin. And I would recommend doing this, not just for the extra credit, not just for the cash prize, but then who can use a thousand dollars? Heck, I could I take the third place prize and be happy too. But um, I would recommend doing that also because some of you have really good ideas, great things like that. So um, put a little team together. If you don't want to do it alone, you can work together with someone on this. If you haven't already got this information packet, you can get it at, at facebook.com slash snowcollegebusiness. And all the information is there. The deadline is October 8th. I also have one other announcement. There's a little handout coming around. And um, it's about an informational meeting that's being held on October 2nd. Is that tomorrow? That's tomorrow. So uh, put it on your calendar, 4.30 in the business building in room 104. This is to learn about the spring break trip that is to Walt Disney World. If you haven't seen the little video clip of last year's trip, it's on Snow's website. It's really cool. You get a behind-the-scenes tour of what business and at Walt Disney World is like. Not to mention a whole bunch of fun with your period of spring break. So, um, and they'll talk to you a little bit more about how you can also earn college credit doing that. Earning college credit while playing on your spring break. So, I would recommend attending that meeting if you're at all interested in that opportunity. Uh, with that, uh, I am going to, I also am going to stick around after class. I do have an appointment with one student that's doing an opportunity quest entry, and I'm going to help a little bit with that after class. And before I do that, though, there's a few of you that need some mid, <coughs> mid semester. Not everybody has this, but some of you have a mid semester grade check thing that I need to sign progress for. And I will stick around to help do that afterwards. So just be patient, wait in line for a few minutes, and I'll get to you and I'll help all of those who need that. And without any further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce today's guest presenter. Today we are fortunate to have Mr. Tom Bailey who is a local entrepreneur that started out with a love of farming and turned that into a successful international hay exporting business. Who would think you could lower hay on chicken hay and ship it all over the world? But they do. They established the business in 1996 when they were looking for a way to expand their market for alfalfa. And I will let him explain to you what cubed hay is and what compressed hay is so that you can understand how it all works. But I will tell you that they are at large exporter, um, a very significant exporter in terms of volume as compared to any other business in the state of Utah. Bailey International ships around the world from the Middle East to the Pacific Rim, and international demand for their, their agricultural products is strong, continues to be strong, and uh, so much so that they not only export their own crop, but they now buy a lot of hay from a lot of other <coughs> producers in and he is also a graduate of Snow College. So let's hear from Tom Bailey. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Go easy on the graduate. I don't think you check my transcript. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to uh, be here today. What a neat place to be. I just don't know if they didn't have it. They didn't have this facility. In fact, Dale and I were both here at the same time. You pointed out, you notice there's no books in this library. I'm not, I'm not too sure I'm smart enough to go to Snow College now. They no books over there. Okay. No, I stole yours. <laughs> but, uh, Anyway, uh, it's neat to be here, and I, I realize that uh, you know, the most important part of this seminar today is who you are and what you become in your future life and what you're able to accomplish, not so much what uh, I and our organization has done. But, uh, at some point in this, this uh, meeting today, there will be an opportunity, and uh, you can ask questions. I would invite you to do that. The most important part would be the things that you're in here. I assume you're here today because uh, number one, you're impressed with class. Number two, I, I believe you're all 
there because you have a whole need foundation and education to help you move along the line. How many of you are really interested in, in being an entrepreneur in your lifetime? Good your hand. Uh, third half of it. How many of you are concerned about finding a job after you try to get college? Most of you. <laughs> well, I understand. I understand. Uh, my talent is that I think some college. <coughs> some 30 years ago, I graduated from here in a great school. I have to tell you, in a great place, which I grew up in. And I talked to a young lady here from Sandy somewhere, and a few other up north. But I have to tell you, you're a good place. It's not a great place. And I attended here, I was, <coughs> and I kind of moved on from Utah State while I was here. I did a pre engineering program went to Utah State and studied for several years. And uh, I have to admit that these men have a bunch of good agriculture Nor have I ever been involved in that same before. Thought it was that I had vegetarian in San Diego County. But uh, I remember uh, shortly after, I think uh, my brother and I got into this together. I have a brother who lives in Denver. He bought a little piece of ground in the question. Maybe I'm vegetarian. I, I had an appetite to farm for whatever reason. Of course, I mean nothing. Getting into, maybe that's why I had an appetite for it. I remember had a neighbor and he used to teach here at Snow College and he had kind of a similar appetite like I had but he had one big difference it's a full time job that paid quite well one night uh, I was visiting with him and he says you know I'll tell you Tom how to become a millionaire really fast and uh, you have to understand I just started what I thought was a great career in farming and he said uh all right, I mean, he had my attention, all right? He says, well, look, he says, you start with a billion dollars, and you go out and buy you a farm, and you'll be a millionaire really fast. And, uh, <laughs> we were young and naive, and it didn't seem to matter a whole lot, so we carried on. But sometime down the road, I realized how prophetic that was. But let me take just a minute and tell you a little bit about, uh, about Bailey Farms International. We actually started in 1986. Uh, this is when I moved back to Ephraim and, and started farming a little bit. And as we uh, uh, you know, started to acquire land and we kept buying more land and more land and, and I was the one here farming it. My brother lived in Denver and, and I kept uh, developing the property and quite enjoyed it. It was a lot of work. Those of you who have been in agriculture, you understand this. but. I didn't know any better, I just enjoyed it, and at some point I realized that, you know, something's got to change here. Uh, this is a lot of fun, but I, I'm afraid we're going to go broke for too long. So, uh, with that in mind, knowing that we could produce a product, I thought, gosh, we got to find a market for this, where we can distribute it and, and uh, have a steady return on it, and, and um, make it a little better than what it is. So, at any rate, uh, in 1996, we, uh, or, or I got this idea that maybe we ought to look outside the area for selling our product, and I was introduced to the international markets, which was very vague and uh, quite difficult to get into, but uh, at any rate, we, we uh, did a little research, looked into it carefully, and decided maybe we'd uh, give it a whirl, and that's where Bailey Farms International came from. Again, it was in 1980 or 96. So we established Bailey Farms International. A little bit of an overview of what uh, what BFI is. We call it BFI. Um, if I can make this work, uh, we like it says we've been in about 25 years. This, this clip's a little bit old, but but uh, this is one of our farm operations right here around Ethan, and. Uh, and we have grown from, from that time to where well, today we, we self-produce about 10,000 acres. Uh, but that only produces about 2-3% to 3 of our product that we ship internationally. So uh, our core business from the beginning was uh, the actual ag production on our own land. Then in 96 we put in uh, 
uh, facility here in Ephraim, Utah, where we'd bring the hay in and we'd process it. And I think I might have passed up a clip here I wanted to show you. No, I guess it's a hat. But uh, our first uh, product that we produced was, was uh, a hay cube. And these are the cubers. And uh, this is the cube that we, we produced. And uh, we'd take the hay and run it through the cubing machine as I just had up there. I don't have these in really good order. But this was our first uh, processing operation. We produced the cubes and, and we had the intent of selling it uh, to, to Japan which was at that time about the only international market that we was aware of. What was interesting about that is that uh, you know, we knew the market was there, but we had no contact directly with the market, and we had to move all of our product through a distributor that was on the west coast out here in the United States. And, and that was a little difficult. That was a real challenge, because they kind of had a rope around your neck, and, and uh, we was told that that's the only way you could move it. And uh, but, uh, we thought, well, maybe we'll try a little different route. We'll market it direct in Japan, and that was tough. But uh, that's the route we went, and that's when everything broke open. At that time, uh, we was producing the cubes and containerizing them, and it's cost me about $2,000 a container to get to Japan. And uh, we thought if we could get direct to the customer over there and help them with our logistics, we might be able to achieve a little greater efficiency, so we did. We went to Japan and worked with the people there and worked out a deal where they'd line up freight and we got the break. Today it cost me about $300 a container to get it there. And that was the beginning of, of maybe a new revolution to exporting overseas for us. And, and so, but anyway, shortly after that, as any business will have, you'll have setbacks in the cube business just fell off the map, went from about 600,000 metric ton a year to a couple hundred thousand ton and the markets kind of disappeared so we, we thought we better figure out a different way to package and process our product and so we come up with what we call a 30 kg hay press. Now this is where the engineering background started to apply as my brother and I looked into ways to process and package the hay so we come up with this package we started to introduce it to the international markets, and there were other people doing it besides us, so we were not the leader. But, but anyway, uh, in 1998, 99, we advanced to, to this processing method here, and at that point we was doing maybe 20,000 ton a year, and uh, then after that we come up with another idea, and again this is a 30 kg package here of hay bales being ready to ship. Uh, in or 2003, we we uh, come up with an idea of another uh, another product we'd offer that'd be easier for the ag industry overseas to uh, manage and handle, and it was further processed and cut up so it had a value to them as far as feeding to their animals. But uh, we put this press in uh, in 2003, and then we acquired acquired another hay plant over in Delta, and then we built another up in. Uh, Tremont in 2006 and uh, you know the, the, and here again you can see more of our uh, product package these are all on the sleeve with our logo that's all <coughs> headed to the United Arab Emirates and then we of course take our product and put it in these shipping containers and put it on a boat and ship it across the ocean and needless to say we have a little bit of product laying out at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean Sometimes the weather gets a little rough and you things fall off the boat. But anyway, that's the visual of who we are. But, uh, you know, some of the, the, the neat things about starting your own business, and I can tell you right now, we didn't have a vision of this when we started. I knew nothing about agriculture. Neither did my brother know anything about agriculture. We didn't know anything about exporting or processing. But uh, what we did know is uh, there was a need for the product that we had and that we needed to get it to a market that had an economy that could afford it. And um, so we, we slowly put it together and developed it and uh, rounded up some good people within our, our company and our organization that were good marketers and, and um, put together an operation. And since then, we've watched markets develop in other countries. Uh, it's been really fun to watch that, uh, 
like I said, when we started, Japan was the major market, a little bit in Taiwan, a little bit in Korea. But uh, as we got into it, we realized that there were other countries that had need for this, particularly the Middle East, which had been historically producing their own products. But they had a real water problem there. Their water aquifers were, were depleting very fast, and the government was starting to restrict the use of those. So we, we started shipping product to the Middle East just to kind of wet their whistle and get their attention, and that market just exploded. And uh, in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, 2006, 7, 8, right in there, we were... We were shipping heavily to that market, about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 ton each day. I remember when we started, we, we, we built a shabby little office and went out and bought a computer, and on the screen of the computer we had a, a little streaming line that went across there, and our goal was to ship two containers a day. We thought, man, if we can ever ship two containers a day, we've really done something. And. Uh, we, in 08, 09, and, and through that area, era, we were shipping nearly 100 containers a day. And now today we ship around 50 to 60. But uh, it's been a great adventure to interact with international markets and meet governments around the world and to travel. We've traveled a lot. We've been involved in a project in Egypt right down by the Syrian border and right out in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And uh, it was fun to go there and see, be involved with the development of land and and uh, put in place a project that was supposed to help feed that area until government unrest hit and now it's all kind of slowed down and shut down. We live in a great country. If you want to be a business owner and an entrepreneur, you're in a great country here in the United States. Many opportunities. Uh, we've been involved in the United Arab Emirates, uh, dealt with government officials there as well as private enterprise and, and uh, introducing and shipping a lot of product to them. Uh, we was uh, right on the front line when China opened up their borders to in importing of, of uh, alfalfa hay into that country and we still today continue to develop that market. We have an office in Beijing right now with a few employees there. Uh, we employ roughly 80 people directly uh, within our production operations and uh, indirectly in transportation and that uh, we have another few hundred there. We have a supply base of about six or seven hundred producers that supply our operations and we operate between the Canadian border and uh, into Southern California right now. But uh, that's kind of a brief overview of, of what Bailey Farms International is and, and uh, what we've enjoyed building and putting together. It's been quite interesting. It's, you know, it's, I look back on it as over the years as we've, as we've worked at this and uh, there's no way on earth in the beginning we'd ever uh, put together a plan and describe what we was going to do and then executed that plan. Uh, I don't think that would ever happen. But one of the neat things in, in traveling and being involved in industry in, in different areas is to, to see opportunities. And I think that's one of the key things with, you know, if you're thinking about uh, being self-employed in the future, uh, running a business, uh, visibility is a very important thing being able to see and recognize the light of an opportunity or to forecast what's out there. And we really enjoyed that. We, I, have to, I have to make this clear. There is no way, uh, no way this, our business would have uh, succeeded to the extent it has without a team of individuals. Uh, we have a great staff. They're sharp people on there. They, they're energetic about what they do and they have foresight and and, uh, you know, we get together often. We was just together yesterday and strategizing. And, you know, it, it, it's just fun to look out there and, and see what you can accomplish. And one thing I've understood, and I understand it even better today, is, uh, you know, difficult things just uh, as you're working at your, your business, or it just takes time and work to get it done. And you get it done. But the neat thing is, are the things that can't be done. 
the things that uh, are most likely impossible. And I, I, I know this, that uh, today all of us enjoy many conveniences and we're part of a wealthy society because of impossible things have been accomplished. I, I assure you of that in the medical industry and in travel and other industry, things that were, were very much impossible 50 years ago or 100 years ago and some even 10 years ago are the things that, uh, that are of great value to society and, and along the way have made people quite wealthy. Um, something that I believe, and, and we have family members that work in our business. I have a son and my older brother, and I have a few cousins and, and a son-in-law. But we just love it when somebody will come in and say, you can't do that. It won't work. If we can make that work, that's what nobody else is doing. And when you generate that product and you offer it to wherever you're going, whatever it is, you've got a new thing on the block and the competition's behind you for a while and you have something and hopefully it's something of a value. Um, you know, when you look at opportunity, I mean, it, it's neat to see it, but you have to take the opportunity and turn it into something of value that has a return to it. Um, those have been the neat things where we've worked on international markets and uh, I was in Inner Mongolia here a while ago working on a project in a land where the government owns all the property and uh, it's not likely that you'll see an industry develop internally there that's domestically successful but now today is uh, I look at it there's over half a million acres in production and generating a large amount of revenue in an industry that we have an interest in. So uh, keep your ears open and, and when somebody tells you something's impossible, that's your opportunity. You may look at that. It may not be as impossible as you think it is. And if you're successful at making it work, you're going to be in a good position. You know. It's interesting as you get into business, uh, you know, a lot of times, and especially the younger you are, one of the main reasons you get into it is because you have this, this glorious idea and, and an imagination. And imagination is a great thing. You visual, visualize yourself as this wealthy individual with all kinds of money or whatever. And, and so you head into your business and that's your motivation. I can promise you it's not a bad motivation, but if three or four or five years into it, that's still your motivation, you'll be one of those that'll fail. Uh, we decided early on in our business that uh, as we started generating income, we didn't specify how much we was going to take personally in dollar amount. We just decided that we was going to take between 10 and 15 percent of the net earnings for personal income. Now, it was kind of meager there for a while, but we felt like the investment of the rest of the revenue into our company was worth more than the money we'd take out of it. And uh, that is an action that needs to be considered whenever you're starting your own business. The money you take out of it isn't going to be worth near as much as your company is going to be worth on the day that you sell it or pass it on. The, its ability to generate income is directly proportional to your ability to reinvest back into it. Now, there's a threshold there. Uh, it takes capital to capitalize any business. Uh, you'll get it from many sources, maybe a private sector, maybe from the, the, the uh, uh, banking system. But you need to figure out real quick what ratio your company you're going to own all the way along and what ratio you're going to let other investors and bankers or whoever, whether it's mom and dad or whatever own, but I promise you, the greater percentage of the, in the interest you hold in the company, the better off you're going to be in the long run. In other words, if you make a million dollars the first year you're in it, <laughs> I wouldn't go buy a new Ferrari. I'd, I'd go down the street and buy a used Volkswagen and take it easy for a while and put the money back in the company. Now here's an example. When we started out, it was tough, uh, tough, it was touch and go, but we kept reinvesting organically from the revenues of the company, 
and buying equipment to process even though we didn't have the market share to use it but we did not mind owning the processing equipment because we had complete confidence and I believe our visibility was correct that international markets are going to expand we wanted to be in a position that when those uh, markets expanded that we were ready to go and uh, so we we invested heavily in buying processing equipment and, and putting together the infrastructure, the logistics, um, supply base, being prepared to interact in an international setting. There's a lot of regulations that go with, with dealing internationally. Uh, when the markets came, we were ready and we were one of the few in the industry that was in that position. You're too late if the markets come and you've all of a sudden got to start you know, your building process then. And we had it and for a period of time. We was the largest exporter of, uh, of uh, forage products in the world for a while. And then we backed off. And there's a reason for that. It's not because the company was failing. There's, you get to a point and sometimes you measure your risk factor and then you back up just a little bit. Uh, it's not a matter of being the biggest. It's a matter of being the most profitable. Uh, that's an important factor for the strength of any company. And you'll sell your company someday, and it's only worth as much as it's able to regenerate. It's not a matter of how big it is. It's a matter of what it can regen. At least that's my philosophy. So, uh, as you begin, and you can begin, you mentioned that somebody's turned into you a bunch of new business ideas. I'd love to see that list. I'd, oh, I wish I had a list of new proposals from this group because I can imagine there's some great ideas there and it'd be great to tear into them and see what you might happen. We started a new company here a few years ago when we had some of our our uh, young guys uh, come on board and it was a logistics company and I, I you know, we met and I says, okay, here's how I think you ought to do this. Uh, and we started that business. We didn't, we didn't take on any additional debt. We just took internal financial strength and put into it and I, I told the boys, I said, there you go. You're going to take 10% of the net earnings of that and you can have it. I hope you can live on it. But if you can make it work, you're, you know, you know, just reinvest in your, your revenues. If you can make it work, you're going to be happy with what you have in a few years. And they took off and they've operated in the positive side for several years now now they're worth several million million dollars now none of them are driving around in a fancy car living up the high life but they have a net worth that's very high that's a great model and i would share that with you as you look at building a business and establishing it uh, you know pay your dues on the early end and and, uh, and i promise you investing your income back into your own company will probably bring a greater return than throwing it on the equities market out here. Most of you are too young to have felt the pain of 2008 and 2009 when the economy took a rather deep dip. Uh, you know, and you want to be aware of that. Place your money where, where you can control it and grow your company and, and make something out of it. Uh, after we got into it, uh, we had a few scares in our business too. We know what it's like to dump a few million dollars here and there overnight. And uh, there's an education that comes along with that. And we soon realized that uh, along with establishing and building a company, uh, it, all companies, most of them, will have a lifespan. Some will have a longer lifespan than others. Some may last a few years and some may last for you know, a few decades. But uh, we realized that for us, we needed to have an exit strategy to know that when, when your company is built to a certain level, uh, at what point do you get out of it? And what's it going to cost you to get out? And I promise you, it'll always cost you something to get out, especially if your business is on the down cycle. If it's on the upswing, the exit costs are little or nothing. And it's a, it's a good prospect. Most people, when they exit their business, she's on, on the downturn. That's no way to do it. You've got to make your plan and be forecasting. Again, visibility is so vitally important. Being able to look out there and project and see what's going on in your uh, industry. You'll have competitors and you need them. 
If you don't, your industry is not going to gain any recognition, and you won't generate enough recognition on your own to make it work. You need competitors, and you need good ones. Uh, and it's okay. Uh, another thing I might mention. Okay, there's a question here. Why do you need competitors? You know, it's a great question. But uh, if you're the only one with a product, do you think that uh, that the whole world, I mean, do you think your markets are going to be big? Other people are in that industry because it's a good industry. Okay? If you're the only one producing something, people will find a way around you, one way or another. You'll never be in it alone. Okay? You're... Your competitors will help spread your market base. Now think about that a little bit, and you'll understand. If there was one football team in the United States, how well would that do? Or two? You need competition to draw attention. And good competition's great. You've got to read your competition. Now we've been ran over by ours a time or two, and then we try to return the favor when we have the opportunity. But... Um, you know, as you begin your business, you begin with who you are and you begin with a thought in your mind. You'll have an idea, you'll have a service or a product that you're going to render to the market somewhere, whether it's domestically or internationally. I'd suggest two things. Number one, there must be a need for it. And don't enter into a market that's saturated. Let me show you why. Is there a, you probably won't be able to hear me. into a market research and it was kind of correct but not right on the money but we could see growth in the market you couldn't see the timeline when the growth was going to come but you could see growth in the market we knew that the pie was going to get bigger and it was going to be easy for us to take a piece of it as you consider what you're going to sell whether it's your services or production of some good you better try and forecast what that industry is going to look like in two or three or four years. Uh, that's an important thing. You more than likely won't push somebody out of the way. You might for a minute, but it'll only take them a little while to regroup and you'll be gone. Most of them have got, uh, they've been well established and they're, they're quite well off and they'll, they'll push you out. They'll drop their pricing down below your ability to produce and you'll you'll be out and gone. You gotta be careful of that. The second thing you need to realize is if you're gonna provide a service or a good, it needs to go to an economy, number one, that needs the good or the service and has the ability to pay for it. I'll give you an example. Assume you own a nice plot of land out in the middle of Zimbabwe or somewhere. And you're digging with your shovel out in the backyard and you run into a diamond mine. It would be wonderful to own these precious gems. But they're not going to bring you a lot of money selling them in the neighborhood. Or trading them for pop bottle lids or whatever. 
you've got to take your valuable product and get it out into an economy where the money's there to to support it. Uh, anytime you produce something or you have an idea to produce something, make sure you get somewhere with your product to where there's a demand and the money to cover it. Like you have to have the affluence and the, and the cash flow there. Um, there's some areas that are that are stressed. Every dollar is allocated and it just keeps circulating from one hand to the next. Uh, take your product out where there's wealth and there's people that want it and then market it and market it well. You know. Um, I was talking to Jay Oates and earlier here and, and uh, uh, he and I, like I say, are the same age and he's been an entrepreneur and, and I, I think I probably still am, but uh, you know, there's no doubt about it. It takes some dedicated work. I, I'm not so sure I'm going to say it's hard work. You're going to work anyway. You're really going to work uh, hard at uh, working for uh, an organization, which is great. It's a fantastic thing. Uh, you'll work hard on your own, or, or you may just work hard at doing nothing. But, uh, you know, it takes dedication. It is a great experience to work with a team, to put together a group of people and uh, I think one of the greatest attributes of a successful entrepreneur is somebody that can listen, that's teachable and able to learn. Um, we've had a lot of great people work for us, and most of them are still with us, that are just sharp. They're really sharp. And many of them are younger than I am. Uh, but having a team of people to work with, that uh, have good minds and, and an ambition, and they're not only in it for, for, you know, what can I get out of it, but they're in it to build and develop something so the other thing that uh, you need to realize if you're in a business for a long haul one of the greatest foundations or one of the greatest fundamental um, elements of your business will be the integrity that you put into it it'll either build your company or it'll sink it uh, if you can develop an integrity within your organization I promise you whatever you're selling, your product or your service, will be of greater demand and bring a greater return. Uh, that's a fundamental thing. It'll have a direct impact to the longevity of your business. And it'll also sink it. A lack of will, will sink it in a big hurry. Integrity is a neat thing. Be careful what you're willing to sacrifice or give for the success of the company. Uh, money's one thing. But to uh, undermine it with uh, poor practices, well, uh, it'll generate no value. And everything you've invested in it will go up in smoke someday. You'll see this, and I've watched it in our industry in particular. So with that, it's 10 minutes after. Uh, I, I think it's important that uh, if you have questions and if I can be of any benefit to you, I'd love to answer those questions. So right now, why don't we go ahead and open this up to questions, and I'll do my best. Right here. Pardon me. I'm, I still. You're asking why did we choose Japan? Right off the bat, that was the only market we was aware of, and it was the biggest market. We did have some acquaintances there. Uh, I uh, I had lived in the Asian area for a couple of years, and I had a young man that uh, had come to work for us. He's one of our partners now, and he had lived in Japan for a couple of years. So that's where he started out. So does that answer your question? Okay. somebody's been watching the news. <laughs> He's asking with our recent scares of our uh, uh, Tremont plant in Delta, we, we had an unfortunate situation this year. We had a little fire and it wiped it all out. But I'll tell you what I learned. Okay, I don't know where we learned this, but somewhere it sank into us. Uh, you've got to protect yourself. You know, it's good to uh, be prepared and think ahead for those operations we had not only uh, you know insurance to cover the loss but we had what we called business continuation insurance so that when you, when you have those losses the insurance come, comes back 
and it pays you as though you're still in operation. Um, you need to prepare. That's a great question, you know, as you're establishing your business. Especially if, you, uh, if you're carrying any uh, financial obligation. You can imagine if you have millions of dollars in a, uh, invested, that you have a liability on and something dramatically happens, you're pretty much off the map and gone. So uh, I think we was covered well. It's turning out well. Uh, but that's a great question. Be prepared as you develop your business. Uh, she, the question is, is, do we own all of our own farms? We own about 10,000 acres, just a little over that. Uh, we produce over 200,000 ton a year, right there about. Uh, let's see, I'm, I should say we export over 200,000 ton a year. We only produce, let's see, in alfalfa sales, uh, we're doing right around 20,000 ton of our own production, so around 10%. So, yeah. Okay, if I understand your question, you, you've done some work on one of our operations and we have some hay plant or stack that uh, you're concerned about or... Oh, yeah. We're transferring from other locations to that Delta location now. So thank you. Thanks for your work, too. <laughs> we already are. Uh, we, we handle other commodities outside of alfalfa, but it never passes through our facilities here in Utah. We, uh, we do a lot of other trading of other commodities from other areas of the country. Uh, that's a growing business that we started some time ago and, and it's an expanding business. But, you know, uh, just a quick comment, you know, I, what we do is, there's no rocket science to, to it, but it's pretty fundamental to the existence of uh, the human race, you know, so we kind of like what we do. It's an industry we seem to think it'll be around for a little while longer. Uh, the question is, am I approachable and how do I get off? We have a website and you can hop on there. You're welcome to come into our office anytime. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Man, that is a good one. You know, uh, all right, yeah, the question is, is, could we talk a little bit about dealing with international countries and maybe the challenges that come along with logistics and getting the product accepted into the country? Is that your question now? Uh, there's three questions there. One, as far as acceptability getting into another country, the regulations are different, whether you're in the Middle East, whether you're in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Japan, they're all a little bit different. But in most cases, they are quite doable. Yeah, you need to research that. You don't have to hire some specialist firm to do it. Uh, you know, there's agencies. Uh, the state of Utah has great agencies through the Go Ed office. Uh, I deal with the the department, the Utah Department of Agriculture, from time to time. I know from experience. I was on the uh, Governor's Rural Partnership Board. There's a lot of assistance there. If you want to do this, go into the GOAD office and get them to help you out a little bit. Now, as far as logistics go, that is a trick. Um, you know, it, it depend, in our industry, it's quite challenging. Something else, you know, if you were shipping one container of a product that might be worth a half million dollars in the container, 
there's nothing to logistics. It might cost you three or four thousand dollars to get it there, but your your product is worth a lot of money. Ours, a container, you know, you're only talking. Well, I, my math isn't that quick, but we're probably about a thousand, twelve hundred dollars a container of value in the, in the container. So, in other words, uh, it takes a lot of volume to to move our our product overseas. Being able to negotiate your your uh, vessel space and the ability to move that takes considerable time, a lot of time. It takes a lot of experience over time. Um, you know, experiences with being in other countries. You know, people are people. You know, they they all want to be comfortable in most cases. Um, you know, they. The people I deal with are typically just like us. They're entrepreneurs and they're trying to develop a business where they're at. Cultures are considerably different. Uh, shoot, we've had a lot of neat experiences. I remember being out in the middle of the Sahara Desert. I mean, that's a long ways from nowhere. And even in December, it's hot. No, we'd shipped a whole bunch of equipment out there for this company out of, out of Abu Dhabi. They wanted us to ship the product out there and he was starting his farm project and we they invited us to meet him in Cairo and then we flew to halfway down the country to a little uh, town called Shakalaway Not and then from there we hopped in the caravan and drove out across this desert to the middle of nowhere and we get out there and there's this military base <laughs> and they're drilling all these water wells out in the middle of the sand I mean row after row and millions of dollars worth of the equipment and whatnot being installed there, and uh, we uh, as we viewed the project, I thought, well, this thing's not going to fly. There's no way. Well, it was a lot of fun. We got ready to leave that evening. Gee, it was late. We had a long ways to go. And I, how are we going to get out of here? And we come over the horizon. You look out across the desert, and here's the tail end of this 737 jet sitting out in the middle of the desert. We just abandoned all our cars and left them there, and we flew off back to Cairo. And uh, it's amazing, you know, how some countries are so progressive. They have a lot of money and a lot of expectations. There's a lot of countries that are developing fast. You know, they're, they know where they want to go, and they have the resources to get there. For this age group, there's a lot of opportunity out there. But any other, I have about two minutes left. Another couple of questions. Let me take this one right behind you here. And Okay, they, the question is, did you see agriculture growing in the future, and, and I didn't get the tail end of it. Yeah, yeah, the, the question is, can, is, you're getting, is it going to continue to grow? Uh, you know, I, this isn't getting broadcast on public TV, is it? <laughs> I don't want to create competitors, but the ag industry is healthy. Uh, you know, uh, the conventional ag is a little bit different. You know, buying a farm and farming, it's a little different. Although that's more lucrative now than it's been in years. And I think Jay Olson would tell us that. You teach a lot of that here at the college. It's a, it's a great industry to be in. There's a lot of sectors out that are going to do well and do well into the future. And I've watched some young men that have headed into... A, a different sector than I'm in. They're dealing internationally in ag. You gotta understand in America, uh, ag is just one of those things that's there, and we just think it'll never stop. You know, you'll, here in America, you'll send or spend between 12 and 14 percent of your disposable income to feed your family. Other areas will spend between 50 and 70 percent. Ag's a big thing. It's a big industry. To answer your question, uh, ag markets are going to continue to grow worldwide and it'll be one of those things that's uh, going to be highly contested and a lot of controversy but you have to have it i think we're out of time thank you appreciate it well, thank you for coming we thank mr Bailey for coming and uh, appreciate all of you being here today we'll see you next week Great advice. Great advice. I don't know. A lot of down to earth advice. I hope it's for them.
not about what we... Get up there. Odd down to earth.